We've got with us Uzma Aslam Khan. It's a pleasure to be here with you this evening, Uzma. And before I even introduce you, congratulations for winning the award yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, I think we owe a big applause, applause for that. And for many of you here who already know Uzma Aslam Khan, I'm going to give a very short introduction because she's going to read from two of her books as well. Uzma Aslam Khan is a Pakistani author. She's the author of four novels, the most recent novels being Trespassing, which was published in 2003, The Geometry of God, 2008, and most recently, Thinner Than Skin, and you can, of course, get all her novels here at Liberty. Now, Thinner Than Skin was long listed for the Man Asian Literary Prize 2012 and the DSC Prize for South Asian Literature in 2014. And, of course, Uzma won um, at uh, KLF as well. And she's also written very interesting, engaging, and what I often call angry and thought-provoking nonfiction writing. Um, we thought we'd start with Uzma talking a little bit about uh, Thinner Than Skin and uh, reading a bit from Thinner Than Skin as well. But Uzma, before you start reading, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about what Thinner Than Skin is all about and uh, the fact that it is set um, within a very harsh landscape, very beautiful, a harsh landscape, very close to your heart in Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Welcome, all of you. Thank you for being here. Um, so my novel, Thinner Than Skin, is set uh, mostly in northern Pakistan, in Karan Valley and Gilgit, uh, Baltistan. Um, it is in part about the semi-nomadic tribes that have lived in these areas for generations, peacefully and successfully, and who migrate uh, in the summer months to the highland pastures, and who migrate back down to the plains in the winter. So they, they, the seasonal migration has been a way of their life for centuries. Um, in the book, the, this rhythm is being undermined for various reasons that I won't go into, but their semi-nomadic lifestyle has come under threat. And because of that, lots of changes have taken place in the areas and certain people are getting displaced. Um, in the portion I'm going to read, which is about midway in the book, a character, Mariam, who is from the semi-nomadic nomadic tribe, she is uh, grieving for a loss. And I won't go into details of what the loss is, because that unravels in the first half of the book. But because of this incident, she has had to cut short um, the summer, uh, the, the time in, in the mountains and move back down to the plains earlier than planned. Normally, they stay from April to about September, but this is still summer and they've come back down to the plains. In the scene I'll read, she's being visited by a man from her past called Gafur, who has left the valley and his life and become a suitcase trader traveling all over South Asia and Central Asia and mixing with other traders um, who are Uzbeks, Chinese, Afghans, Russians. And um, all of them mix together to trade, but they all have a ve very fierce sense of their own identity. At the same time, they also have a collective sense of the need to get along, if only for economic reasons. So I'll read to you a little bit. Usma, just a minute before you start reading... I just want to add here, you know, the novel is also like when you talk about Mariam, I think about the glaciers. So maybe if we talk, or you talk rather, a bit about the entire glacier meeting, would you like to do that before or perhaps? Um, okay, so, you know, the, the, those of you who have traveled in the north, you, you know how the, it's, it's the most glaciated part of the world outside of the polar caps. And I've traveled quite a bit in these areas, and um, I remember one of my trips, somebody told me about the, the glacier mating ritual, which is a very ancient one and a very secret one, and I never actually got to see it. 
but then I was traveling with someone on a flight and, and he came from there and I mentioned it to him and he said yes and they even have you know they even name glaciers each one has a name each one has a gender and uh and 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 the the ritual is is done in part uh, as a way of uh, of of sort of preserving water i mean this is this is how water is, is made i mean it's, it's creating water and um and so that that sort of comes up in the book a lot the book is you know the landscapes in the book i think are are what moved me to really write the book i've I, I love this region, and and I, it's just I think one of the most beautiful parts of the world, and the natural world does move me. In all my novels, I've written a lot about the nat- the physical world, and um, and I could talk a little bit more, yeah. but I think I should read now. Yeah, so. maybe a little okay. after you're done. With okay. It. So, like I said in in this uh, extract, Mariam is being visited by a man from her past called Gafur, who has left, but he's just come back. Mariam kept her back to him. He was here at last, the one who had left her a blue feather in her mountain shrine, the garlic breather and honey carrier, the one who once told her there was a land outside land, outside mountains even. Now he was back in her home in the plains, laden with stories as when she was a child. You wanted to see the farthest away river above the glaciers. And I would say this was asking to see heaven. He was waiting for a response, but she kept her back to him. Sometimes it was desirable to put a mountain between yourself and someone else. Well, he continued, I have seen it. Heaven is in the steppe, where there live nomads like us, with names like ours, but with sounds added on, and unlike us, they live free. What sounds, she asked the ones you used to think were funny. She still did not turn to face him, but she could not forget these oddities about him, from the signs to the jade to the flute and his many attempts at changing his own name. Rusifying it, he called it. For instance, Rahman became Rahman or Rahmanov or Rahmanov. But you are not Rahman, she would say, but I could be and now I'm Rahmanov. Another time he was Yusuf and his name was changed to Yusupov. Yusupov, she giggled. Yusupov, he repeated, of Yusuf. He said they followed Islam up in the steppe. From there he had come to her with stories to chase away her fever dream and return her to this earth. He said he had also been to a place called Leninabad and a place called Chinistan where he made friends who gave him jade in return for leather better quality jade than he had traded for in the past. He cleared his throat and she could feel his eyes at her back, searching for a way to find the stone around her neck. She said nothing. He started talking again. They drank mare's milk and ate horse flesh, these new friends. He could drink the milk but not even taste the flesh of the animals so beloved to their tribe. He stuck to mutton and duck. Mariam's only idea of a duck was from the graves lining the road between Balakot and Naran. She did not want to think about graves. He told her about flowers. She listened more closely. They have rare cloth embroidered with flowers, this part of a flower. Look. He leaned over her reclining body and dropped in her half-open fist a yellow flower. It was larger than her hand and it was pointing to its center with his own hand, the hand from which she had once licked a honey tinged with garlic from his sweat, a hand darker than she remembered. The heart of the flower was the color of fire. From within the fire grew a cluster of silken threads, each tipped with a pale green bud. When she brushed the buds, she brushed his palm. A hundred pollen grains fell onto their flesh. Into the flower's heart would dive a bee, she knew, for she had watched this happen many times, though never to a flower such as this. The bee would carry pollen on its fur, and from the pollen would come honey, and from the honey would come bliss. The Uyghur, he was telling her, as though their hands had not touched, had at one time sewn these glistening threads in the heart of the flower into their cotton garments. 
She wanted to taste the pollen on her skin. She could not bring herself to do this while he watched. He had stopped talking, but she could hear him breathe. Then, in a whisper as weightless as the gold spores, the Kazakh nomads have a saying. Everything alive is in movement, and everything that moves is alive. Wind and water, flowers and bees, he paused again. You must learn to move again, Mariam. When he left, she pressed the tip of her tongue to the tip of her index finger. Do you want me to read on? I can read a little bit more. We can, we can discuss, Mariam. Okay. Thanks for that, Uzma. It was beautiful. Um, you know, you, when you, whenever you, uh, whenever we've, we've talked about uh, Mariam as being my favorite character, I know we'll move to yours in, in, in geometry, but she's a very strong woman. And uh, I know we're starting with, all, with women characters that you've written about, and perhaps we, we should talk about your process. But now, since you've read this, it, it's very interesting because Mariam is, she's strong, she's full of hope, and yet there's sort of pain and grief um, in her story, in what happens. And, and I'm not going to give that away because I'm sure a lot of people want to read the book. But there's a passage which is really my pa favorite passage, and it's, it's just a sentence really. It, it, it explains your title, and I want to read it out. In later years, she would ask Mariam if her skin was thin as a goat's, and Mariam would tell her the truth. It was thinner, which meant, of course, that if a goat could be shred that easily, so could a woman. Usma, talk a bit about the character of Mariam and generally the women characters that you've written about and thought about. Um, you know, I write women characters and male characters both. Um, when I'm writing a character, I don't, I don't give them qualities. I, I, I don't write strong characters or weak characters. I, I'm not trying to make them into, you know, in, into, into people who would fit these adjectives. I'm, I'm just trying to understand where they're coming from, what their story is. I'm trying to get into their skin. Um, but it, it is true when I look back, and I was only thinking this recently when, when Rizeshta and I were talking just before coming here, that I suppose if I look at all four of my books, there are recurring themes. And one seems to be um, incredibly smart women, thinking women, with questioning women, women who spend a lot of time uh, reflecting, um, but who are somehow not able to put their intelligence into the world. It doesn't mean that uh, you know they don't have a lot to give. It just means that there's a lot of inhibition there. And sometimes the inhibition comes from within, but very often it comes from without. And in Mariam's case, I mean, she, she comes from a, a place where you know, there are certain customs that are, that are quite um, rigid. But at the same time, there's, there's also fluidity there. And I think it's this that... I, I'm very fascinated with is the spaces that women are allowed to to make in, in, so that they are able to keep that fluidity at the same time that they are faced with a lot of restrictions. And and if Mariam is, is in grief, it's because of a certain loss that she suffered earlier in the book. But it's also because, you know, she her eyes are open. She's seeing how her valley is changing. She's seeing what's happening. The forests are being cut. The grazing grounds are being lost. The seasonal migration is getting shorter. The, um, there are certain militant groups that are coming into the valley and setting up camps and recruiting young men from the area. Um, her, her mother was a very feisty character, and she sometimes a lot of the flashbacks are of her mother. Who, who had a, a sort of a sixth sense. So the spiritual life of Mariam is also very intrinsic to the book. And um, so there's all of this. And I, I hope that I make a complex character rather than just, you know, a, a character whom we can, we can understand as, as just one thing. Um, when uh, KLF chose uh, Thinner Than Skin for their award yesterday, I just got this email. So I'm going to read it out in between and I'm going to interrupt the 
questioning because uh, Framji, who was on the judging panel with mm -hmm. Muniza Shamsi, they sent me this right now, this email, and it would be very interesting to hear what they had to say about Thinner Than Skin. We had to choose among three truly excellent novels, all compelling in their own way. We decided on Thinner Than Skin by Uzma Aslam Khan because of the eloquent and elegant way she reveals different worlds with mostly restraint. The novel animates mountains, lakes, wind and fire and other elements of nature that echo the complex emotions of her characters. We'll speak some a, a bit about that. Through the carefully structured plot and the well-wrought patterns of recurring images and incidents emerge insights about homeland, belonging and dislocation central to contemporary Pakistani life. Uzma, this is, this is very beautifully put. He uh, should be a writer. <laughs> I, I like he's not up here. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, you know, they've picked on, like, uh, the, the thematic concerns that you have in this book. Homeland, belonging, dislocation. And I would add um, identity, you know, some sort of identity. And with that, for me, comes... Uh, the importance and the intensity of memory. And, and, and that sort of, I think of that often when, when in the past when I've read your um, novels, Geometry Included. Can you speak a bit about that, how important memory is? And for memory, there's inspiration, there's family, there's, you know, the past, history. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, just as, as a simple example, I mean, the first time I traveled in the areas that I'm writing about was, you know, early 90s. So a long time before I actually started writing this book. And, uh, you know, it stays with you. Things percolate. So the, the glacier that we crossed on the way to Lake Sefal Molik, you know, we actually, some of the things I described we experienced. And um, I didn't know at the time, you know, how much that moved me and it just sort of stays with you and then when, one when day you're that? writing when was that early 90s okay um and and i think so much of what we write uh, as a as fiction writers is is a, is a very curious blend of you know what we've experienced what we remember and how that feeds our imagination and how it allows us to invent something completely different from from that but also, you know, just you're talking about the landscapes of my books and the lakes and the wind and the water. And this does come up. I think all my novels, you know, are very, uh, in, uh, they're in love with the physical world. Um, I mean, I think I am. And where did this come from? I don't know. But I recently told somebody else that, um, you know, my father died four years ago. And before he died, he left me a few pages of his life. He was a very private man and had a very difficult past. And knowing how I longed to know him, he wrote a few pages for me. And just a few months before he died, he gave these to me. And one of the things that uh, really struck me was the sweetness of the voice. Um, he, he could be a very strict man, <laughs> but it was a very sweet, sort of uh, jovial voice and he had such fond memories of growing up as a child and his nana was a hakim and he used to collect herbs for him and help him make his medicines and it was so interesting because I was reading those passages of his writing and thinking to myself that without him telling me this before I feel like I, I was already seeing that picture. I, I already imagined this. I already imagined those plants. I already imagined those herbs. And in this book, Mariam is, is very well versed with, with the forest and the medicinal qualities, the medicinal um, advantages of some of those native plants. And she knows all about them. And some of them I looked up, but some of them I already knew, and I don't know how I knew them. But I, I do think that, you know, we, we carry some thing much older than ourselves when we're born. We, we inherit memory. Yeah. And you know, when you talk about your father, did he read all your writing? And uh, can you talk a bit about your upbringing? Because you moved, you moved from, uh, you were in London, you, you mentioned you were in Tokyo. So, so this sort of movement, and then you, you were in Morocco, and 
in Hawaii. How does it uh, help your writing, inspire, motivate? You know, how does it how does it help you as a writer when you're not living in Pakistan? You're writing outside of Pakistan. I'm sure this question has been asked to a lot of Pakistani writers because they do write from outside of Pakistan. A few are here, like we had H.M. Nakwi earlier. We have uh, Mohsin Hamid, who lives in Lahore. But, but yourself? Well, the first part of the question, how did my father respond? He was, um, he, he, you know, he read the three books that came out during his lifetime. He saw my parents do read everything, but I was very secretive about my writing. I never showed anybody anything I wrote till my first book came out. Um, did they know you were writing? Probably. <laughs> I mean, I think they know I kept a journal, <laughs> but I used to hide it. Uh, and, and I was very, uh, I wasn't confident about my writing at all. And, and I didn't show it to them. I didn't think I was very good. You know, I mean, in Pakistan, if you're a writer, you have white hair, you're a man, and you've been in jail. And, and that's sort of the, the, the sort of, I think, you know, maybe my father even said that to me once. Like, you know, you have to have experience to be a writer. And I thought, oh, I don't have experience. I'm too young. Um, so I just sort of, uh, I, I, was, I was secretive. Um, there were other parts of the question. In terms of where I write, uh, you know, the geometry of God, all of it was written in Lahore. So even though I have moved around a lot, I've, most of my life I've spent in Pakistan. How, how does the moving around help, like after you moved and you wrote? Well, all my books are very different. And mm. I mean, maybe one reason why, you know, I finally wrote a book about nomads is because my life has been pretty nomadic. Uh, my childhood was very nomadic. Um, I, I, it's because my father worked for PIA and we traveled a lot. Um, but then we settled in Karachi when I was 10 years old and, and you know, I, I went to a convent where the history we were taught was British history. So I, I never learned in Pakistan, Pakistani history that made any sense to me. And I, and I remember uh, walking, you know, in, in, in during, uh, Independence Day parades, we, you know, there was a statue of Jesus and Mary, and there was a Pakistani flag, and Zial Haq was sort of on the blasting uh, speeches uh, on, on the megaphone, and, and I would walk between the flag and the, and the statue of Jesus Christ thinking, you, you know, where am I? <laughs> like, where am I? And, uh, and I think it's, in part, it's to make up for what was never said that I write. It's, it's in part to understand where I, where I come from, not just in, in a small sense, but, you know, larger. I mean, the, the whole country that, that, I, that I write. But um, does it help moving around so much? Yes and no. Geometry of God, all, it took me six years to write that book. And I was living in Lahore at the time. And it, and it was good that I didn't move because that book, I think, could only have been written in Lahore. Um, you know, this, it's, it's such a voicey book. It's written in the first person, and a lot of what I was hearing around me sort of made its way into the book. I left then, and then I wrote this book, which is a book about nomads, and I was very unsettled at the time that I wrote this book, and so probably that helped. Trespassing was in part written in Pakistan and in part written in Morocco. So um, I think I've always had in me this urge to keep moving, and movement is really important to me, and yet also a, a, a longing to nest both. I mean, uh, and, and there's, a, there's a contradiction there. I recently read this interview um, with the Chilean author Isabella Lendi, and, uh, you know, she says, I think I write fiction, but I don't. And she says she draws on her life for her work, and that, that, that makes sense perhaps for, for a lot of writers. You write uh, very thought-provoking non-fiction as well. Everybody knows uh, about your open letter to Obama in 2008. Very angry, very sort of, uh, you know. Does everybody know? Does everybody know about that? <laughs> open letter to Obama. No, some people are shaking their heads. The, okay, so do you want to just explain well, that? Maybe you can. Okay. <laughs> in fact, I have an extract right here which is very, very interesting and very pertinent because all the discussions we've had today are are very political discussions about the Taliban. So I think you wrote about this a long while ago. Let me read a little bit. This letter was written to uh, Obama in 2008 for Counterpunch and titled, Where's the Change, Barack? Um, 
To add insult to injury, Pakistan is also a U.S. ally in the war on terror. We're also living in the debris of this war. Our own internal conflicts, which multiplied during the 1979 to 1988 Afghan war, have multiplied even further. You want change? Be the first U.S. president to understand these internal struggles. To add more insult to injury, we have done your bidding for as long as we know. In return, you threaten to bomb us. Which part of terror do you not understand? I mean, I've, I've left out quite a bit there, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's sort of very hard-hitting. And the reason why I uh, refer to this is I know it's your non-fiction writing, but it ties up a lot with your fiction, especially when I read Thinner Than Skin. You have a lot of references to what we see happening to Pakistan today. You wrote this in 2008. It's still per very pertinent today. Mm -hmm. So basically, your, your, your political awareness, your, your sort of ideas, and the way you bring them into your fiction, I find that very interesting. In fact, I find that very important. Do you want to comment on that? Well, the letter was, as you said, written in 2008. He was a senator. It was just before... Uh, the, 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 his first term um, and yes I was very angry and I'm still very angry and I think anger is uh, you know it, it's, it, it, it galvanizes you into action sometimes and, and the, I think I'm most active when I'm writing um, so that was my way of, of hitting back and you know it was frustrating I had just left Lahore and uh, a lot of my friends were supporting Obama, and even though he was making threats, and uh, and, it, it, and, it, and it just amazed me that they were not willing to see that he had every intention of carrying them out, and of course he did, and it's you know one of the few promises he's kept, and um, but nothing nothing has changed really. I mean, he came. That's again, what I mean that. that uh, I don't know how many people have read Thinner Than Skin in the audience, but when you read Thinner Than Skin, I'm not going to give away the story, but you, you talk about what is happening to Pakistan today, and uh, you use the natural landscape for which you have a lot of respect, but which is also being targeted in many ways, because you wrote another article when you... Um, talked about the mountaineers who were killed in Nanga Parbat by the Taliban. And, you know, you say, what is this? Why is this happening to our country? Can you talk a bit about how you, you sort of brought these thoughts into your fiction, into Thinner Than Skin? Because it, it also reads like, it's almost like very thrillerish at one point, you know. It, it, the book? Yeah, not the book, not the entire, but there, there's, 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 there are passages where you know, they, they're hiking over these glaciers and, and, and you feel, okay, what is going to happen now? And, and, and it, it's, it's, it's what's happening to us in Pakistan, really. I mean, the, you know, when I'm writing fiction or nonfiction, mm. it's still me. But fiction does have its own process. And, and as I said, I mean, I, you know, it does begin with the characters. And I don't have a story when I write. I only know what I'm writing when I start writing. And, and, and that's why, you know, you have to kind of discover your own language. I often say that when I'm writing fiction, I begin by driving the car. I'm sitting in the driver's seat, but very soon I'm the passenger, and it's my characters who are driving. Um, with nonfiction, I think I keep driving. I think I'm, I'm more in control in some ways, and, and, and I... But with fiction, I, I sort of become a slave to where the story is going, and that's where I have to go. I have to listen. Um, but in terms of that, that article you mentioned, yeah, when there were 11 mountaineers killed in Nanga Parbat over the summer, and um, it infuriated me. I mean, this was the base camp, and in order to get to the base camp, they needed to get local uh, local men to to guide them so they i think one of the things that really angered me was the way local men were made complicit in their act of crime in in, in the, the, the taliban's act of crime in soiling Burr mountain um, with which they have a very sacred and, and respectful relationship so so their hands were bloodied and 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 that was an it was a defilement on so many levels yeah, let's talk a bit about um, the, the difference in language between 
How much time do we have? Not that much. Should I read from geometry? Yeah, you want to read from geometry. Let's do that. Do you want okay. to read from geometry and then we can sort of okay. open it up for questions? That would be great. Um, so in 2007, I, uh, this book, my, my previous novel, The Geometry of God, came out. Um, I started writing this book many, many years before. Uh, I had been living with Lahore, uh, in Lahore, and on my drive to Islamabad, I would pass the Salt Range Mountains, and, and because I love walking and hiking, I, I would get out and sort of walk around and see a lot of fossils scattered on the ground, and they were just lying there. And I always wished that I, I had the language with which to read them. I, I didn't have the language. I didn't have the sight. Um, and this got me thinking about so many things. I, I, uh, you know, the, the many ways in which his, history gets written, miswritten, lost, and who are the lucky ones that just happen to stumble upon something and then know how to make sense of it? And who are the ones who are lucky enough to find something but don't know how to make sense of it? Um, and, and how not knowing how to make sense of what you are lucky enough to find is a kind of blindness. And... Uh, then one day in the newspaper, I, I came across uh, an article saying uh, that an American paleontologist had discovered the first, the ear of the first whale, and the, and the whale was called Pachycetus. And, um, and, and I got very excited because the discovery was made in the Salt Range Mountains. And um, I started thinking, well, what if, it, it was a Pakistani scientist because without the help of Pakistani scientists, the, the American could not have made the find. And then I started thinking, what if it was a woman, not a man? And then I started thinking, what if it was a girl and not a woman? And, and then a, a, I heard her voice. I heard this child's voice and, and a scene came to me. Um, so I, I just want to read you the beginning of the geometry of God, which takes place between an eight-year-old girl named Amal and her grandfather, who is a scientist and a very fierce yet loving man. Um, and he is trying to teach his granddaughter the language of rocks. I'm walking with my grandfather in the Margala Hills. Because it rained last night, the air is sweet and the ground moist, but Nana walks so lightly I know his slippers won't get dirty. They are soft red leather slippers and the veins on his feet are large and fierce. I take his hand, rough and spotless like his feet. I take it because he never forces me to take it. When we reach our pool, I unlace my mud-spattered joggers, check for snakes, and settle on a lump of limestone that was once below a sea called Tethys. Nana sits beside me, and I wait. From his pocket, he pulls out two small rocks, brown and ugly. I was hoping for a bio nest, neatly stitched with a few dirty eggshells still inside. Nazar Sedeko, Nana's voice is firm, He's telling me to look closely with the inner eye. This animal was alive once. It swam in the Tethys. I see no animal, only the ugly rocks. See though how the rock has split into two, says Nana. I stare at two people sitting under an acacia tree, away from the water's edge. Nana told me once that acacias help prevent soil erosion. They have small white flowers when they bloom. They couldn't have bloomed in the Tethys. You can tell by the way the man and the woman under the tree are whispering that they aren't discussing soil erosion or ugly rocks. See how this part sticks out slightly like the name on a rubber stamp, insists Nana. That is the fossil, a bone that has become stone. I notice the color is different where he's pointing, but it's still an ugly rock. The protruding half is called the positive. It's in his left hand. The other half, he lifts his right, the negative. Or he looks away thinking, when you press your pencil hard on paper, the front is furrowed. That's the negative. The bumpy back is the positive. Now imagine if your pencil nib got stuck between the pages of a book. That's what happened to this brachiopod, except the book pressed so hard, it changed it. Isn't that amazing? I begin to see something. 
If I stare in the mirror after a shower, waiting for the steam to cool, slowly a wet head appears. I only know it's me because it has to be. Something like that is happening now. The longer I look at the rock, the more I can almost see it, except I don't know what it should be. It can't be me, and I can't cheat by clearing a circle in the mirror. Over the rock in my hand, the mist keeps clearing. With my thumb, I can trace inside the triangle it, counting seven, maybe eight arms. The top opens in a slit. I see it. Thanks for that, Isma. I can see it. We can stop them. Yeah. I have a question. Um, how different is um, geometry of God from uh, thinner than skin in terms of perhaps technique, in terms of uh, the voice that you use, and even 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 the the, the characters? Because even, even when you read uh, to thinner than skin. No, sorry, different. What? Uh, uh, like the technique that you use, the, the, the first person, second person uh, narrative, and how difficult is it to sort of change when you're attempting, uh, you know, your, your next novel? I mean, both novels started really differently. I remember when I started The Geometry of God, um, I actually had, had gone uh, to Malaysia for the summer, and, and I came back. And uh, in, in my state of jet lag, I heard Amal's voice. <laughs> and, um, and I woke up in the middle of the night and I wrote it down because I had been struggling with her voice. And, I, and, and finally, I, I felt like I got it. And this book, you know, there's Amal, her sister, Mevish, who's blinded early in the book. And there's a character, Noman. They're all written in the first person, and it's a very direct kind of style. Um, because it's first person, I think it's very intimate. It's probably my funniest book. I don't know if others would agree, but I think it's a funny book. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it did begin with a voice, but with Thinner Than Skin began with an image, and it, and it became, uh, you know, it's, it's a very visual book. So, um, so there's, there's, there's no sort of uh, technique or there's no formula or method to how perhaps a writer, and, and in this case yourself, would, would sort of set yourself to doing you know, something or coming up with a storyline, a plot. Do you sort of think of this beforehand? Yeah. And also, I know this sounds absurd, but do you, I mean, do you write on tissues? Is, oh, no, she's is it okay to? <laughs> is it okay to? She's so I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated <laughs> with that. I mean, how, how, uh, how do you, I mean, how does that work? Um, I don't, I mean, it's, the technique is, is there, but it's, it's different for every book. So I don't, I don't have a formula at all. And, and I think it's the book that sort of slowly unravels the technique to me. Um, in terms of writing on tissues, there's a there's a YouTube video that you're referring <laughs> to. I I the, all of the geometry of God was written on tissues. I, I don't know why, um, but I just sort of started scribbling on tissue papers, uh, and 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 that's all I wanted to write on. So the the whole book was written on separate tissue papers, and at one point, in fact, um, somebody cleaned the table, the dining table, because I had all these notes there, thinking that they were dirty tissues. And, and, and I lost a bunch of the book and got really angry. But anyway, so yeah. But I don't write on tissues for every book. It just happened with that one. Okay, should we um, open for questions? Right here? Pramji, the first row. Should we take Pramji's first? <laughs> and then... Okay, the, the gentleman behind you, Framji, and then after that. Um, first of all, congratulations on the award. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask, when did you actually realize that you wanted to be a writer? And which authors uh, do you believe affected your work? Um, I... You know, I didn't never consciously thought of myself as a writer. Uh, as I said, I wasn't very confident about my writing. I used to hide it. Um, and I think that the, the, the label writer, you know, it's, it's a somewhat arrogant one. And I still think that. I mean, you know, to walk around saying, I'm a writer. This is, this is a very presumptuous. Um, 
So it, it wasn't something I said I wanted to be. It's just that I turned to writing because it's where I felt at home. It's, it's something I had to do. It's something that balanced me. It's something I could not not do. So uh, because I was doing it, I mean, my teachers were very encouraging in school. And in fact, when I went to grad school, a lot of my peers were sort of submitting stories for publications and things, and I never did. Um, and then basically once my first manuscript finished, I showed it to somebody who said, well, you know, why don't you try to get it published? And I thought, okay, nobody will be interested, but I'll try. And, and then Penguin India took it. But it actually took a long time to find somebody who was interested, which only said to me that I, I was right in keeping my stories hidden all those years. <laughs> Ramji? Oh, your favorite authors. Oh, well. my favorite authors. Um, I read Virginia Woolf a lot, and A Room of One's Own was probably probably shaped me uh, more profoundly than anything else I'd read when I was a teenager. It was my sister who gave me a copy of that book. And I remember she had just gone off to college and I was in Karachi. And she handed this to me and it was in the 80s. And, and I felt like it was more powerful than a bomb. And that's <laughs> when you know we, we were having all the problems in, in Afghanistan and crime in Karachi was spiraling. And and to me, I had a bomb in my hand. A woman should have a, her own income and, and a room of her own. This was an idea that blew my mind. Um, and, and it really, I took it to heart. And uh, I've never let go of it. I have always insisted on having my own room, my own income. When we were actually discussing the novels, um, uh, when Muniza, Lynette Vikaji, and I were, one of the questions that we had was about the choice you made about telling the two narratives in two very different voices. Mm -hmm. So Nader and Farana's narrative is told from Nader's point of view, which is incredibly courageous because he's just an awful cad. Yeah. And, <laughs> and um, Mariam's narrative is told from the third person point of view. Um, could you talk a little bit about that, why you made that decision and how those two came together? for you? Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. You know, uh, it's so fun writing from the point of view of someone who isn't very likable. You know, the, it's just, it's really liberating. And, and to write from the point of view of a man is especially liberating. I mean, you can just, you can really shed all that skin and, and you can be a jerk. Um, and I really got into that character and I was uh, sometimes a little afraid of how much I was enjoying being a jerk. And, and then I thought, well, this is, this, is, this is the joy of writing, is that you, you can live in somebody else. So Nadir is so self-obsessed. It had to be in first person. He's so about me. Um, Mariam is written in the third person, and that was, um, that, that was a risk. I've never before written a book that is partly in first person and partly in third person, and I didn't know if it would work. I remember when I started doing it, I was thinking, you know, what, what are you doing? Why are you doing it this way? It, it's never going to work. And yet, Mariam was speaking to me, and this is how she spoke to me. She spoke to me in the third person, and I realized it's because she's, she's part of something bigger. She's part of a bigger world. She's not... Uh, insular like Nader and she, she's much more rooted in, in her environment and, and sort of um, has a relationship with it which, which far uh, you know which, which, which is deeper and, and goes further than just herself so it had to be in third person you know I just want to ask you a question I should have asked you this before but as much as I uh, enjoyed reading Mariam I just had I just wonder why Farhana, okay, Nader was self-absorbed, but Farhana, I, I know your Farhana bothers her so Farhana much. Farhana bothers me very <laughs> much because I feel, okay, she has her, her identity issues. I mean, who, who doesn't? I mean, you could live in Pakistan and have an identity issue. But you, I mean, you create her with so much, I think with so much finesse that you allow her to bother us. So at least she bothered me right till the end. I found her very self-absorbed and very selfish. But, you know, I, I think 
people like that exist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, and I think, you know, we can't just create lovable characters when we write. No, and, no, uh, I agree. But you did her so well. <laughs> like, uh, how, how, what sparked her? I mean, how did she take off for you? I mean, what was it? Did she just come along? Or? You know, her interactions with uh, the people of the areas I'm describing um, are, are so slanted and, and so uh, imperialistic. Um, and I think I was sort of just picturing, you know, I've had many conversations with people who travel to our part of the country with a certain attitude that somehow they're you know, they're, they're do-gooders, but not in a sense that is uh, positive. And, and she, she, she thinks that she is needed here in a way that she's not needed, and she doesn't mm. get that. And, and her not getting that is exactly what causes so many of the problems of the book. And, and she still doesn't get it. And I think that's true of so many of us, that we, you know, sometimes we don't know when to stop. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. Beauty is uh, skin deep. So uh, how do you relate your topic uh, thinner than skin uh, with that word? And also, uh, since I am a businessman and uh, I would like to know whether you are interested in commercializing this uh, into a film or a movie or whatever, or on the uh, uh, television, because it seems to be uh, very interesting uh, for me. Thank you. Usma, should we take one more? You want to take one more and then answer them together? Okay. Yes, my question is relating to the, the title of the book. Rather intriguing title makes you wonder what is thinner than skin. I just wondered, do you get the title right at the start or do you uh, look at different titles and decide at the end? Good question. Um, with some books that I've written, like Trespassing, I, I had a title right away. I knew I wanted to call it Trespassing. Um, with this book, I had another title. And my agent really hated it. And because my agent has been loyal to me and I have a relationship with her, I sort of thought about it more. And in, in hindsight, I think she, she was right. The title I chose was, was a little too subtle. Um, and so this was my, my next choice, and she loved the title. And, and the title really came from the book because there's a chapter, Thinner Than Skin, and uh, Razeshta read the extract. And you know it comes right after the loss that I mentioned earlier, which I don't want to tell you what it is, otherwise you won't read the book. But I'm glad that you like the title, and I hope that you read the pages too. <laughs> In terms of um, the movie, by all means, make a movie. <laughs> yeah, we can have actors and actresses from my audience. I mean, I don't know if I could watch, but... Um, once a book is out there, you know, I mean, my books are my children and you have to let go. You have to let go of your children. I mean, uh, that said, uh, I do know that when Trespassing came out, somebody, somebody was interested in making a movie. And I, I just, I just, I mean, I just wanted to hide. I just could not, I couldn't let go. So I, we can talk. <laughs> <laughs> do we have any others? I'm sorry, I can't, I can't hear you. You said the, why the title oh, okay. is thinner than skin. Is uh, it related with the... It's, it's, it's very much related is, uh, to... Uh, skin uh, deep. No, no. It, it's not. It's, it's, uh, the context is in the book. And I think if you read those pages, you'll see where it comes from. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here. And thank you very much for Uz for Uzma for being here and explaining everything in your book reading. Thank you. Thank Uzma. you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, thank you Rajeshtha.